You know, compared to their friends across the channel, sometimes I think the French get a bit of the short end of the stick when talking about scientific and industrial history. If you take a look, though, as we will here today, at the Musée des Arts et Métiers in Paris, I hope you'll agree with me that the French have plenty to be proud of and clearly were very innovative. The Musée des Arts et Métiers is home to an amazing collection of scientific instruments, machines, models, early machine tools, and so much more. It has the oldest industrial and technological collection in the world. We'll take a look inside at some of the spectacular objects in the collections and the stories behind them. The Musée des Arts et Métiers, literally translated the Museum of Arts and Crafts, sits in Paris's third district, right at the city center. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're a Yank like me and you hear arts and crafts, you're thinking maybe something you did as a kid. I think a more accurate translation for English-speaking ears would be industrial arts and trades, but that doesn't even entirely do it justice. Calling what we see today a museum is fair, but it's really so much more. When it was originally founded, it wasn't a museum at all. Yeah, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. From all over France, and even the world, scientific instruments, drawings, models, and full-size machines of every kind were brought together to educate and lead France to a more industrialized and prosperous future. Additionally, skilled artisans like clockmakers, glass and ceramic workers, iron workers, and others made France famous the world over. And all that knowledge was brought here in order to serve as sort of a national scientific and industrial think tank. From here, it could be passed on to others and distributed throughout the country. Because of that history, this is not just a museum that was built upon objects collected for the purposes of creating a museum, but rather a museum that sprung from an incredibly rich collection that already existed from an institution designed for learning and teaching. And it got its start in 1794, so you can only imagine how rich the collections are. The museum's the collections are vast, and there's no way to give a comprehensive overview in a reasonable amount of time, so I'm going to focus on a few of my favorite objects and tell some of their stories. When you first come into the collections, you're in what's essentially the attic. I don't think this is some of the oldest parts, but these huge wooden beams have to be at least a few hundred years old. This area of the museum is the scientific instruments collection, which is surely one of the finest I've seen. Everything here is first class. It's my understanding that many of the instruments were um, acquired during the revolution from the nobility, which I can only imagine was an awkward conversation. In the scientific instruments, the highlight for me are these mechanical calculators. They were invented by the brilliant French mathematician, physicist, and inventor Blaise Pascal. Pascal had figured out how to do something completely new, invent a mechanism which could automatically carry to the next column when necessary as you added or subtracted. Amazingly, this was in 1645. For his efforts, he was awarded a prize from the king in the equivalent of a very rare patent. Over the next 10 years, he would make 20 of them with Only four nine. of them being displayed right here, plus a clone made by somebody else. and look at things very few people have ever seen. We're trying to answer the question, who made this and when? I've been obsessed with this object for a few years now. The very first video I ever made for this channel was an introduction to the problems in history of precision and measurement. The video thumbnail is even a rendering of a CAD model I made for this micrometer, from largely just guessing at dimensions from a few old photographs I found. And then I started to make my own replica. If you watch that video, you'll get a better idea of how insanely important this may be. Micrometers can measure repeatedly to pretty high precision, well below the thickness of a sheet of paper, and this very device is likely to be the world's first micrometer for measuring physical objects at that kind of precision. If you had told me a few years ago I'd be holding the micrometer allegedly made by James Watt in my hands and taking it apart, it would have completely blown my mind. In my view, this is very possibly the first device to add a second or possibly a third decimal place to precision, which has mind-numbing implications. To be able to consistently work to that level of precision gives you the modern world. Almost everything in your life is dependent on the ability to measure very, very small distances. 
You'll notice I'm using a lot of weasel words, implying we don't know if this is the first end measurement micrometer, or who made it for sure. But our investigation today is to try and answer that question. And it's been a mystery for well over a hundred years. Even the Science Museum themselves say in their display reputedly for a good reason. Does it look like Watt's hand? Could it have been made with the tools we knew he had? We don't know. Let's dig in. So how does it work? If you turn the small crank on the big back dial, it is fixed to a screw that runs along the middle. Riding on top of that is an anvil which can slide. Also, the screw drives a worm gear which turns the small dial. The back has 50 divisions, the small one 19. I've also seen pictures of the worm gear and I know it has 23 divisions, and the lead screw is about 18 threads per inch. So the first thing we can notice is that it's not decimal. What about this possibly being a forgery for the special loan collection? First, I'm going to say everything I say here is my opinion only. I'm by no manner a pro or have special training to say anything definitive about this. But I do think, having made projects for many years, I can start to infer some patterns. So first off, in my opinion, the object shows too much wear to likely have been constructed specifically for the exhibition and be passed off as Watts. We'll look into some of those areas in a moment. Does this look like the hand of Watt? This is where I get out of my depth very quickly, but that's not going to stop me from having some opinions. I think it shows areas where someone had both a lot of skill putting it together, and areas where it was not someone's finest work. Was this someone messing around? Was it just a prototype? Watt was an instrument maker before making steam engines, so he definitely was able to make gear to high standards. But did he always make everything to that standard? In no particular order, here are some of the things we noticed when taking a closer look over about an hour and a half. Firstly, I'd never seen the back, and I don't think others had either because in other replicas I've seen everybody gets it wrong. What you see here are the three posts which hold the small dial and come all the way through and then are pinned on the back. There's also what looks like a lot of hammer marks which don't seem to have anything to do with this part. I'm guessing those were from another project and this makes me think this was originally a scrap piece of material, though I can only imagine for the time this would have been rather valuable. On the front, the small dial is soldered onto those standoffs which are pinned on the back. Speaking of the small dial, the hands have a brass bushing soldered into it and it's rotated off center. I bet that happened during the soldering process. On the big dial and back, there's a stray hole that doesn't seem to have any purpose. Again, it makes me wonder if this came from something else. On both dials, there is knurling or reading like on a coin around the outside edge. Why if the rest of this is somewhat rough would somebody put a decorative touch on this? Probably practice? Also on the large dial, there are what looks like extra circles cut or etched on both the front and back that serve no purpose, not even really decorative. Again, this makes me think that maybe this was practice, or possibly this piece was repurposed from another device. There's also a lot of faint circular marks that makes it look like this dial's been turned many times. If you look at the graduated marks on the large dial, it appears they were made with some kind of dividing engine, at least at first. But if you look a little closer, you can see how there is variation in their size, so I believe this was likely indexed by hand. Also, it's hard to see in the photos, but sometimes the small in-between marks extend a little too far, but they are very straight, which suggests to me they were made in some kind of crossing out device like clockmakers use. When we remove the hand from the large dial, we immediately notice the large hands have some brass stocks soldered into them, which sits proud of the hands themselves. Long before we got here, someone tried to remove the large back dial, but the screws wouldn't move much and the big dial was loose. We didn't dare try to remove them further. We then discovered something neither of us had noticed before. The main body dials and stand are all of brass, but the rest is made of wrought iron. If you look carefully, you can see the strata where the iron has been hammered over. This is especially true on the small fixed anvil where it's actually curved a bit. Does this suggest more 1770s than later? Maybe? One of the problems with trying to date things from this period is that it took technology sometimes decades to become ubiquitous, and like today, people with different skill or wealth levels have access to different methods. But personally, I think the wrought iron speaks to this being older than newer, relatively speaking. Let's flip it over and look at the bottom. We can see the accession number, the year of the collection when the micrometer was added to the museum's collections, 1876, and the item number, 1370 but we can also see the screws holding the base on, and they are terrible. I know this is a bad photo, but both slots are way off center. You can also barely see there's an extra hole just ahead of the rear one, which was never used. That looks like a transfer punch mark was made on the main micrometer body to locate a hole that was never drilled. 
but also look at the quality of the outside base holes where the mounting screws would have been. They're terrible again. Not even close to round and very rough. It also looks like the holes are intentionally hand countersunk from the bottom and top, which is odd. There are countersunk screws on the back of the big dial, and they are much better done. Does this suggest two makers? When the micrometer is right side up, the base is actually a little shorter than the bottom of the U, so it sits a little crooked unless something is placed under it or it's off the edge of a table. Was it made later and someone screwed up the height? Or was it intentionally made to sit off the side of a table? But either way, if we flip it over and look at the top, wouldn't we expect to see some evidence of screws that had held it down to something? Even if washers had been between a screw holding it down on the micrometer, or even countersunk screws, I would expect to see some marks. But we don't. What does this mean? Was this ever actually mounted on something? So now looking at the anvils that actually do the measuring, when we take them apart we start to see some really interesting stuff. I presume this is something only a handful have ever seen over the last couple hundred years. First, we notice the moving anvil has what looks like to me wear on the top and it's pretty uneven. This suggests that the bottom dovetail is not very flat or parallel. In my highly inexpert opinion, it seems to me like this item has actually been used a fair amount, though you can also see some stray file marks from the maker still. Back of the fixed anvil shows some hammer marks. What do those mean? Bottom of the moving anvil is very interesting too. We can see it's pretty rough with lots of file marks, but also notice how the threads seem wider in the middle and less at the ends. This says to me it's bowed. Also, notice that the area above the thread is filed down to clear the screw threads. This is obviously filed, not drilled, which to me suggests someone with older, cruder tools than something more modern. Comparing the flatness of the dovetail surfaces on a reasonably flat tabletop does show that indeed they are far from flat. The same with the bottom. Looking at the lead screw itself, though, it's fairly rough, but perhaps not too bad for the supposed time it was made. One thing that's really interesting to me is that there are what look like marks at either end that suggest it was held between centers on a lathe. Could many lathes the 1770s cut wrought iron like this? What kind of skill level did it take? I know there were small clock-making lathes, but I don't know if they were cutting iron, though I'm far from expert here. I'm not sure how common metal cutting lathes were with tailstocks on them. And then all you had was foot power. I think it suggests the threads were likely chased, which makes sense, but I still have so many questions here. So after looking at all this detail, what do you think? Was this made by James Watt in the 1770s? Was it made later? Who do you think made it? I want to hear what you think in the comments. Personally, I'm not yet drawing any conclusions. I think the evidence could go any number of directions and more work needs to be done. And again, anything I've said here is my opinion. But what drew me to this piece is not just its place in the history of measurement, but also the innovative use of the screw, particularly the lead screw. There's also a worm gear, and of course the screws that hold everything together. For a simple device, there's a lot going on here. Today I'll be making those screws utilizing a number of different techniques. Each of those three kinds, the worm gear, lead screw, and the machine screws holding everything together, are made in very different ways. Let's get to work. The worm is made of brass. I'll start by center drilling, and then drilling slightly under the final size. And I'm turning two diameters. One is where the hand will be attached, which will be machined square later. And the other is the necessary diameter where the teeth will be. That's a critical diameter. Let me show you how I'm calculating it. I want 20 teeth on this worm gear. The cutter is 20 teeth per inch, which is 50 thousandths per tooth. So the 20 teeth I want at 50 thousandths per tooth is one inch. But we're actually going to machine the diameter. So we simply divide the circumference by pi and we get 0 0.318 and a half thousandths. Once the correct diameters are turned, I'm parting off and turning the piece around and then I'll ream the hole to exactly one-eighth of an inch. I'll put a little chamfer on the end by running the lathe backwards and quickly cutting the backside. Now I've made a little tool for the worm gear to spin freely on. It's just a piece of mild steel which has a one-eighth piece of steel rod pressed into it. 
I'm using a little 1000 grit sandpaper on it until the workpiece would spin freely, but not really have any play. That's all mounted in a tool holder and brought to the lathe. Setting the correct height required a little thinking. I ended up putting a rod of a known dimension into the lathe and adding half of the rod's diameter to my desired offset from centerline. Then using my micrometers, I used the depth end to set the right height. Probably not perfect, but it's accurate enough for what I need. Now here's the trick. To cut this, I'm using a 3 8 inch, 20 tooth per inch tap as the hob. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. 3 8 inch, 20, that's not very standard. It's not. It's a specialty item, but they're out there. 20 teeth per inch is useful because it divides into one inch so nicely. And 3 8 is better than the very standard quarter 20 because it gives us more strength over the distance we need. I'm sticking the tap directly into the chuck. With the speed low, I'm plunging the workpiece directly into the tap. Now you'll understand why the diameter is so critical. Because the tap will rotate the workpiece around, and we need to get the right dimension so the teeth will line up. But that same diameter is a problem later. While necessary to get the teeth to line up for later operations, like cutting the end square to hold the dial hand, we're going to need to put it into a collet, and it's currently a little too big for my closest collet. Now that the teeth are done, we can take a few thousandths off and get it down to a nice even 5 sixteenths. And that's where we're going to leave the worm gear for now. To make the lead screw, I'm starting with 3 8 inch mild steel and center drilling the end. Then, after pulling it out to length, I'm bringing the tailstock in to support it. Now, it's not shown in the following clips, but I'm relying heavily on a travadile on my carriage to help with the measuring. Someday I'll get that DRO. First, I'm going to turn one end down, where it will pass through the support block in the micrometer and eventually have the dial hand attached to it. Again, I'm using the travadile to measure how far I want to cut, and then making a small score to mark it. Quick word about the cutter I'm using. This looks like a carbide insert, but it's really high speed steel. While these are not well known, I think they're great in the home machining environment. To use carbide inserts properly, you need really high RPMs and deep cuts, which most home lathes are not well equipped to do. The high speed steel insert is, in my opinion, the best of most worlds. I'll talk a little more about these in a future episode. This insert came with a 15 thousandths nose radius, but before putting it into the holder, I rubbed it against a sharpening stone until almost all of that radius was gone. This will give the thread a little more accurate minor diameter. Finally, I'll do a couple spring passes for cleanup. 
a couple light strokes of the file, and we're looking good. To finish the screw, I need to part off the waste stock on the other end. If I put the screw into a regular three or four jaw chuck, I'd run the risk of messing up the threads. So instead, I'm switching to a Jacobs Rubber Flex Collet Chuck. You don't see this around too much anymore, but I find them really handy for a lot of situations. The collets are rubber with metal that runs the length of them and can expand or be compressed to accommodate a fairly broad range for a collet. When you have an odd size or something delicate, the flex collets are a great choice. All that's left to do is part off and we've got a good looking part. What seems like the simplest item to make, the machine screws that hold everything together, is actually going to be our most involved part. I'm going to machine some tooling that will allow us to get a good finish. First, I'm taking a scrap piece of cutoff stock and cleaning it up in the lathe. Then we're going to mount on the lathe on a V-block with a small piece of scrap to make up the difference with the V-block. I'm going to find the center of the part and then start milling down until I get the desired flat I'm after. Then, on either side of the flats, I'm going to machine some steps. You'll see why in a moment. With the steps done, they fit well in a tool holder. Now with the part vertical, and again held in with a V-block and a parallel, I'm finding center again. Now I'll use a center drill and drill a pilot hole and then another drill that's slightly undersized. And then finally I'll come back and ream to exact dimension. Back in the lathe, I'm taking a piece of stock and sanding it down to just a tiny bit with some thousand grit sandpaper. This makes a beautiful fit with the other piece. So much so, in a rare quiet moment in the shop, you can hear it's almost airtight even though it spins freely. Off camera, I've made a tailstock die holder. It features some of my prototype screws. I'm pointing this out because I think this is what is called foreshadowing. With the lathe running at slow speed, I'm moving the tailstock in, and I'm using just a little bit of pressure to get the die to bite and start threading. After that, I'm still feeding the tailstock, but with only enough pressure to keep up with the die as it feeds. At the desired depth, I flip the lathe into reverse and feed the tailstock in the opposite direction until it's clear. This method takes a little bit of practice, and there will probably be tears a couple of times when you have to remove tiny broken pieces of steel from a small die. Once you get it down, it's totally worth it. Then I'm going to turn the lead screw head down a bit, but not close to final size. You'll see why later. All that's left for this step is to part off. I'm taking another piece of scrap cut off aluminum and facing it on the ends. I'm using some spray adhesive to put fine emery cloth on one side and thousand grit sandpaper on the other and then back in the chuck it goes. I can then take the little tool post mounted tool we made earlier, remember that? And get it nice and perfectly aligned with the makeshift disc sander. I probably should have mentioned I don't have a disc sander. That's why I did this. If you or someone you love has a disc or belt sander, I'd probably use that. <laughs> 
Now I can use my screw on a stick to run the cross slide back and forth while it's turning to get a nicely, really squarely sanded screw head. First with the emery cloth and then with the fine sandpaper. Because the screw has such a long part that's not threaded, I had previously turned down a little spacer piece out of scrap. You can see it here with the little step in it. It serves to support the screw, but also the smaller part of the step is the desired head size of the screw. Once I have the screw head to size, I'm using a flat piece of steel with sprayed on emery adhesive on one side and thousand grit sandpaper on the other. The little step on the spacer gives me enough room that I can really keep the sanding square to the sides and I don't run the risk of rounding over the corners. Once the screw head is sanded down, I'm going to deploy the Dremel to do some final polishing. The lathe is running backwards, so it's going the opposite direction of the Dremel tip. I have some diamond paste, and I'm going to go through a couple of different grits, 5 micron, 2 and a half, and finally quarter. I buy these felt polishing tips off eBay in bulk, and I pair the tip with each grit so I don't cross-contaminate. Okay, it's time to cut the slot. I put the screw on a stick into a collet in a collet block and then mount it in a vise on the mill. I carefully measure the correct height and then start to cut and then disaster. Somehow the stub arbor wasn't completely tight and the blade had a little bit of wiggle in it, which led to a poor quality cut and angling down. The screw, which had been the cherished workpiece, is now scrapped. <laughs> Because I need to finish this video, don't you despair. I grabbed one of the other screws from the die holder I mentioned earlier, and we'll bring this home. Polishing the top is very similar to doing the sides. With screw on a stick still in the collet chuck, I can hold it steady and polish the screw head. We're aiming here for something clock and watchmakers call black polish. That is to say, the polish is so high and flat that you can see the reflection of a light source well, but when it's turned away, it suddenly is nearly black. And after a few passes with the diamond polish, I think we're there. Not absolutely perfect, but for something which can be done in a few minutes, I'm very pleased. 